It's June 16th, 2011. <laughs> ah, I'm Mike Benedetti. This is 508, a show about Worcester. And the weather is good for swimming today. Whew. A little chilly. Also, today on the show, as our guest and camera holder, Community activist Joe Hart. Joe Hart. Hi, Joe. Good evening. Let's go to the little log over here. This is a very nice location, but very different from city council. It is. It is. Yes. If uh, people at home who watch the city council meetings will say, "Is that that? Is that that?" Yes, it is. That's it right there. Go ahead. You can go ahead. Sit right there. It's fine. Um, there's been a lot of things going on the last week in Worcester. We had a, a polar bear die. There's been news that. Uh, the uh, the triage center opened in the wake of the PIP closing has kind of become the PIP. There's people complaining that the Albion uh, SRO Hotel on Main Street is kind of like becoming like the PIP. We've heard news this week of the dark and perilous labyrinths of the dark mazes and perilous labyrinths of a modern Sodom. All kinds of news this week. But we're going to talk to Joe mostly today. Actually, let me see the other side of you because oh. I'm blinding. I'm blinding the camera. Sorry. Ah. Well, I'm facing the sun now. Now you're okay. getting blinded. Am I? <laughs> what if I? If, is this going to blind you if I kind of block this? No, that's okay. We yeah. usually don't tape here in the evening at okay. this time. Well, my interest is basically sort of the feel of how the city tends to make itself. Okay. Which I think should all be changed. It's very hostile. You mean to um, to to? Well, it's just hostile all the way around. You know, it zeroes in on cars. Sidewalks are unwalkable. It's really concerned with, you know, cars and not transportation and not people. Mm -hmm. As I said once, it's the only city I know that's made impassive verb. You know, <laughs> there are a huge amount of areas that you can't go through. You know, huh. the Worcester Medical Center, the DCU Center, you simply can't get through. There's, because there's just you giant know? blocks of built giant, up stuff. Yeah, three or four, you know, blocks that you mm -hmm. can't get around without walking around it. Or, of course, as they do, they go in and park. Sure, sure. You know? So, so Joe, I wanted to ask you. Um, I, this is this is part of a series of conversations that we've been having to answer the question: What do I'm blinding Joe again by leaning out of the light? What do you want the candidates to be discussing as they compete for votes in this year's city council election? And as we've said before, this is kind of a perverse question to ask because the elections, by and large, are not decided based on issues. But you know what? What the heck? We can do what we want to do. So we're going to talk about issues. Um, so, Joe, you are a you are a, 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 a civic activist. Well, I've turned into that. I was never how, that before. How did you get, how did you, b b before we talk about issues, just introduce yourself to people, because people, again, like, see you at the city council mm -hmm. meeting, haranguing the city council and whatever. Well, what happened once, somebody at CMRPC asked me, like my background, how, how have I always done this? And I said, no, I've just never been in a place where I was treated so terribly. <laughs> how, how long have you been, how long have you? It's true, it's true. It's sort of fighting back against what I call civic brutality. How long have, how long have you been in Worcester? About ten years. About ten years. Ten or eleven. Okay. Yeah. And what was the, what was it that what was it that made you say I'm mad as hell? I'm not going to take it anymore. Uh, well, partially you have to realize too that I had more time to do this. Well, it's the buses. You know, I first okay. started off with, uh, you know, trying to work to make the WRTA be a better bus system. Mm -hmm. You know, not cut routes, not slash everything. Uh, and then of course the reaction to that by the city and everything was to I felt put the buses out of business, you mm. know, just get rid of them, you know. Mm. Like the city square development, I felt like, you know, if you don't have a BMW, don't come to Worcester. You know, that's all the city really wants. Because there's not, because there wouldn't be good bus development or because it would be too expensive of stuff? or what No, because they, that's all they want. They want riffraff like me to leave. Ah, you know, they want ah. just simply people with BMWs to buy condos. Okay. And of course, right now, with the, what I call the freight dump, the CSX, you know, freight yard expansion in Worcester. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see how, even if that plan continued, City Square, how you would expect anyone to buy a condo a few blocks from a freight yard. That's a good question. You know, so the city seems to be working. Maybe at cross purposes. At cross stuff. purposes, yeah. Sometimes, that, sometimes I do wonder about that. What is the vision? What is the vision that the powers that be have for the city? Is there a vision or is it just a big mess of, this is what seems okay this week? This is what seems okay the next week? Well, I think they don't think about anything except just very small little issues, like mm. uh, also large issues but far away, like Arizona. You sure, know? sure. Um, 
uh, anything they can focus on to not focus on the city. Mm, okay. And of course, the city has a huge amount of problems. But I see a lot of that as basically kind of an attitude. You know, I also said once or wrote once that uh, because there's no music on the common, there are no dogs on the common. I felt like at some point they're going to say, you know, no Irish, no Jews, no people. Mm. You, know? you mean no music like there's the, the signs that say? I think there's a sign actually on the common that won't let you play music. Yeah, busker. Course, I lived in New York for a long time, and so of course I'm used to a lot of street life. Yes, and the yeah. city wanting street life, or the city cracking yeah. down on. As we one, the one issue that we constantly harp on this show, and I'm glad to harp on it again, is the city trying to drive out hot dog vendors. What do you feel well, about? Are you, are you are you in favor of the increased restriction on hot dog vendors? I'm not in favor of any restriction. Okay. Basically, <laughs> I'm in favor of legalizing drugs, of course, foremost, sure. because if you take away the profit motive, you take away the problem. Sure. Uh, so basically, I don't like a lot of restrictions, but if you have them, they should be worked out. Totally, not just simply one person slapping down something. And just have something that's sort of like, this seems like it probably could work. Let's just do it, and then let's not revisit it, and let's not. Well, I wanted to ask you then. I wanted to ask you this question. What do you want the, what do you want the candidates to be discussing as they compete for votes in this year's election? Like, what are, the, what, are the, what are the issues? Like, when people come on this show, or when they're having a debate, or when they're out there on the radio, or whatever, what issues should they be talking about? Well... I know the main issues that people in the city are probably interested in because they discuss it all the time are taxes, bringing industry to the city, sure. pilot, you know, sure. the payment in lieu of taxes and so forth. My idea is that if you make the city a more livable city, if you make it so that people want to come here, mm -hmm. if you can get a hot dog, for instance, okay. play music on the common, <laughs> if you can get through this impasse of three or four blocks. Carry a knife longer than three inches. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, you know, no eating apples in the park. Oh, my goodness. Um, if you make an, a social ambience, a social atmosphere, mm -hmm. as I said once, it's very strange that the most public place in Worcester that's a social place is a hospital, you know, which is the atrium in St. Vincent's. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's both nice and, of course, pathetic because it's true. It is a nice it's public a, space. Yeah, but it's about also the only space, mm. you know. Um, my idea of when I first started doing this, of course, was about the roundabout at Union Station, and I thought the underground place, where now Blatting Buses Park, would be a wonderful place to have, again, what I call social interaction. Hmm. You could have flea markets, you could have, um, you know, outdoor cafes, right. you could have flower shops, you could just have a lot of things, you know, but it would be a place for people to meet on their way to a train or, you know, through the car or whatever. So, so one, um, so one thing people should be, one thing the councilors could be talking about then is just the ambiance of the city, life of the city, the feel of the city. What do they see that is? Well, what should we be shooting for? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Go what ahead. I mean is, they get in their cars, they park underground, they get in their car and leave. Mm. They don't walk around the city remotely. They don't have a clue how many people have fallen, and you know, fallen almost lethally on the sidewalks, which on the are ice. right outside, on not even ice. on the ice. That's another oh, story. Okay, just on the poor sidewalks. Um, I so there's the, no... I fell on the ice one time. I had to go to the ER. Well, I fell on the ice 20 years ago and had a herniated disc, oh my so goodness. I don't... <laughs> I don't walk on ice anymore. I walk on the street. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Um, but I just mean there are a lot of so-called quality of life issues. That's a hackneyed expression, but it's true that people don't pay any attention to because they drive. So, so is your thought that they should be talking about quality of life because, or, or feel of the city because that's more important than the other things or because if you take care of that the other things work they out they work together they all okay. work together yeah okay. if you as i said once to mike o'brien you know if you see 50 people sitting on a chain link fence opposite city hall you know anyone who came here to do business could not leave fast enough hmm. you know it's uh anti-everything hmm. um and so i think Wor worcester should learn to be inclusive and of course, I'll get to my big issue, which is raising revenue. That okay. I think everything here is subtraction and not addition. You don't think about how can we raise money, how can we make things better. Uh, but just simply, you know, you have a budget, you ask people, you ask employees, you ask whole divisions. Mm. There are ways and means of raising a lot of revenue. So, so revenue, so raising revenue then would be another thing. To me, because it also the revenue causes a better quality of life. Okay. If you find people far parking at bus stops, mm. if you find people far turning right on red or all of these things, if you find people for riding bicycles downstairs, 
I'm sorry, downtown, <laughs> which is illegal. Yes. You know, it's a state law. No bicycles downtown. Wait, no bicycles downtown? Yep. It's a really? state law, unless the city does something otherwise. And the city has not. I've checked it out. I never heard of this. The city could make a fortune alone. Just in the are you could. suggesting? So, are you suggesting that they should, that they should enforce those kinds of things? Oh, absolutely. If you find the elements, they will stop. Okay. They will stop doing it. I mean, policemen also just turn right on red at uh, Chandler Street, you okay. know, on a red arrow. Mm. Uh, there's just a lot of things that would make living better. You wouldn't have to be scared of crossing the street or getting hit or something. But also, you can raise money. I think the whole entire WRTA could probably be funded if you just... Um, Crack down on traffic laws. Or even traffic at bus stops, sure. Hmm. Parking at bus stops. Hmm. There's just a lot of things like that. Uh, you know, the same thing is true, of course, of drunken driving, although that's more, more of a highway issue. Sure, but, sure. Uh, but, you know, just money alone could pay for all kinds of things. Sure. Now, you were telling um, me you, you live in District 4. Mm-hmm. And one thing we've been wanting to talk about to people about is a little bit is district issues. Do you have any thoughts on? Uh, I think we've actually had a lot of district four people on this show down through the years. Mostly, probably mostly district four people on this show down through the years. Do you have any? Are there any neighborhood issues there oh. that the council should be talking about, or is it? I'm not really sure. I want to get into that now. Okay. That's such a complicated kind of issue. Okay. Um, but of course, there are issues: trash in the street, all kinds of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. There's also just a lot of no conversation issue. Like you see a building all of a sudden for sale or the sale sign is taken off. You don't know what it's going to be. You don't, you know, there's just not a lot of conversation about hmm. what is happening. Yeah, and yeah. I would like to see that. I would like to see a lot more inclusion, not exclusive. So when you say conversation, do you, mean, do you mean more just like this kind of stuff being out there in the public sphere? Or do you mean neighborhood groups being more active in that kind of stuff? Well, I guess, in a sense, too, I would like a newspaper <laughs> oh, <laughs> that would cover yes. a lot more issues. I think that, that, yeah, I think a lot of that stuff can be handled if somebody's just uh, writing in there and saying this building was sold and this is what the owner said, told um, us on the phone. But it's kind of hard to figure that out as you're just going around your day. What is this, what's going on with this plot property? Yeah. I mean, there's no way city council can, of course, really handle that. But I just mean, well, in a sense, I, I wish there was more interest in in things happening. I think it's okay to ask. I mean, I think it's okay to bring up issues, at least to city councilors, that they don't necessarily directly affect, just because it's interesting to know. Like, I really want to ask all the city councilors about school privatization, you know, even though that's the school committee thing. I'm just very curious to know where they stand on that that kind of thing, increased charter schools and whatnot. Well, again, it sounds like a throwback to the old private parochial school thing. I don't know. You know, to make things more exclusive. And here he is. We, today we have one host with no shirt and one host with a shirt and a tie, Apparently Brendan Mellick. no uh, contest as to who's the best dressed man in the forest today, huh? <laughs> the least dressed going? man. I'm Sorry I'm late. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. After two hours on the Massachusetts Turnpike. Ooh, fantastic. Testament well, we, to engineering. Yeah. Well, we were just talking about, uh, we were just talking about uh, uh, civic issues, as we sometimes do on this show. Sometimes. What we should be talking to the city council. You want to... I'm just trying to get a good. I'm just yeah. There you go. The, the lighting's better if you stand over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're to talk to the city council though. We were going to talk to the city council about raising revenue. What am I thinking? Of? Raising revenue. I would like a discussion about raising revenue and, as I said, quality of life. You feel, know, feel of the city. The two things that actually matter. Feel of the city. <laughs> well, this is her argument: is that if you take care of these things, the other things are just whatever. Well, they come, everything comes together at some point in time, right? I mean, that's where you start out, you get some sort of syner- synergy going. And uh, Do you watch the, the show much? We talked about something in terms of revenue a couple yeah. weeks back that I was thinking about tomorrow. Online tomorrow, bill paying? On, online bill paying. It, 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 tomorrow, this is tomorrow's Bunker Hill Day, right? So okay. to all my state friends out there that have tomorrow off, you know, enjoy the day. Um, so tomorrow I get to go to City Hall, and I get to pay well overdue extra excise tax bills, right? And I never pay my excise tax on time, not because I don't like paying excise tax, I end up paying three or four times what it's actually worth by the time I get around to it because everything's done in paper. And uh, this, this remain, the stuff that I get from the city of Worcester is now officially the only bills that I get in paper. Every company that I do, do business with, which is a large, you know, as a homeowner, like a ton of companies, everything's email reminders or it's automatically withdrawn from a, from a checking account online or what have you, just automatic bill pay and what have you. The city is the one place where I, act, I actually have to do all the effort to go in and pay them. Which is bizarre when you think of, I'm sure the, the overwhelming majority of, of people who live in the city probably still 
deal with paper and checkbooks and what have you. But there, you're going to get to a, a certain point where you know my demographic is going to replace that demographic, and people are going to be saying, "Well, we'd love to give you more money, but you make it really, really hard for us to do so because what you do have for online systems are typically very, very poorly thought out, take a lot of you know figuring, and uh, the the idea of doing something as simple as paying a bill. I think we made the, this comparison last time we were talking about this. It's really hard not to go to Amazon to go to Amazon.com and not buy something. Whereas like with the city that's always looking to increase its revenue stream, they seem to go out of their way to make it hard for you to give them your money. Which is well, true. I'm, go I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that I think though lately, because Michael Brand is interested in things like that, I think lately they have been trying to make many more things online. I they said, put their entire checkbook online. I would make the online. argument that they have done nothing of consequence um, in 10 years in, in regards to updating the way that they handle bill payments. I mean, they, we, even for like things like parking tickets, we deal with a, a third party that, I can't remember the name of the company, they, they deal with a lot of municipalities. It's an awful system. You know, I mean, online transactions are just something that you know, I think most of us take for granted now. If you wanted to go and buy something online, it's just take, it, it just happens, right? It's almost like magic. It's easier than get, going to a store at this point, which is, you know, the downfall of so many brick and mortars that aren't putting in the extra effort. For a municipality, it should be the same thing. It's like, you, you want my money. We, we agree on that, and I'm willing to give it to you. But don't make it hard for me to give it to you, right? I mean, it should be making it easier to give it to me. This is an interesting question to me because it seems like they should be doing this, right? Like, if all these private businesses are doing it, they're not doing it because they're only doing it because it's cheaper for them to do it that way. It, if it's cheaper it, for them to do it that way, it's presumably cheaper for the city to do it that way. When your cell phone There's company also, or your bank it sends you an email saying, we'd love to offer you paperless billing uh, for, as a convenience, it's not a convenience. It saves them a fortune. Talk to any anybody that's in, in on the city council. Ask them what it costs to actually send out a mailing to every person, you know, every registered voter in the city. One mailing. Mm -hmm. You're talking a, the majority of their war chest just for an election cycle for that one mailing. It, it, when you now think of every excise bill, every parking ticket reminder, every water bill, every sewer bill that goes out via paper, it's a fortune. Well, this is why I want to ask them, because presumably there's some reason that they're not just doing it. And I am just curious to know if the candidates know what they're... I don't know what it is. I feel like I can't... If, I, if you're a candidate and you want me to vote for you, you should know enough about the city to know what the, what the deal is there. The problem is I, you know, I, and, and maybe Mike is trying really hard, and maybe he hits a stone wall, and, and you know, there are some fiefdoms well, that he can't uh, not, conquer, or what have you. But yeah. I've, I've never had this conversation with anybody in City Hall, and had somebody look at me and say, "Yeah, we've been, we're trying so hard to make that happen." Usually, it's the exact opposite. They look at you like, "What are you talking about? You, you, we can do that?" You know, I mean, there's more of a, a sort of confusion that, you know, the, the potential is, is even exists to maybe take in more money than they already are. In a, in a simpler fashion, simpler for a certain demographic. Again, acknowledging the majority of people probably still do write, che write checks. I don't. I have like one checkbook that I think lasts me like six years. You know, because it's there's, I almost never write checks. The city is really the only only entity I write check paper checks to anymore. But again, I, I think you're going to see a growing demographic there that is going to be looking for easier ways to give the city money, and the city is almost the one that's putting up the stone walls and now saying, we demand your money. But we just don't want to make it easy to take it easy to take it from you. But well, it could be wrong. It wouldn't be the first time. Again, though, I'm a person, not being an Amazon person. I'm a person. I'm a very tactile person. I like money. I like cash. Sure. I like to touch what I'm buying. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, of course, we're working at opposite ends. But I think certainly both should always be available. I think that's very reasonable. Uh, yeah, I think it's very reasonable as well too. I mean, and, and you know, it's there, there is no reason why you can't have somebody who can pick, you know, take in a check or, or what, what have you. And, what are you collecting? Uh, broken glass. I would oh. just hate to see somebody or a dog step on this while we're talking. But um, well, not while we're talking. <laughs> after we're talking. But you know, recently this is going a tangent, and I won't make it one. But you know, the Economist wrote a really good article about Bitcoin recently, uh, describing <laughs> what Bitcoin is as a currency. It, but the Economist actually did a pretty good job with it because their explanation was more that to focus on Bitcoin as a currency is really uh, missing the whole point of what a currency is. A currency is whatever you want it to be. Like you mentioned, cash is what you like to deal in. Cash isn't any more of a currency than you know uh, uh, an exchange of uh, of labor or you know a bartering system. It's, well, I'm in favor of a bartering system. Right, exactly, and that's what I mean. You know, it's it, it's at some yeah. point in time we, we all need to, as a society, figure out. We we almost without giving any thought determine what our currency is going to be. And currently, our form of currency is going into a more paperless direction. I hate the idea too. I mean, I, I actually prefer cash as well. It's just not very convenient anymore. Um, so I, I find myself almost never. I, typically, the only money I have in my pocket is going to be a stack of one dollar bills to give out to people, panhandlers. Everything else is done with debit cards. You know what I mean? That's that's the only real use that I have for for for, for cash anymore. 
Joe, did you have? A, did this you? Was, I'm sure this was a really nice conversation we before just, I just yeah. meandered over here and ruined everything. <laughs> That's his job is to ruin everything. <laughs> Um, I don't want to. Do, well, what else? Thing, what else is there that's important? One thing I would like to bring up because city council harps on it a different way, and I think legally they can change it, which is pilot in lieu of taxes for the universities. Okay. Um, what do you feel about the pilot? I think universities. Well, in the first place, I would not demand money. I would rather them open the universities to people okay. to use their facilities, to sure. use the library, to use their computers, to take classes, audit classes. Mm. Um, but if they're going to demand money, I don't. I would rather them, and I think legally you can. I would rather take away the nonprofit status hmm. and just don't have it be a begging. And just have a it be a, a, like a, a thing like anybody like else. Like any business, because yeah. they are. You know, it is a business. The thing, though, that also bothers me, and I've been much more aware of this recently, is the amount of storefront uh, religious groups that are in the city. Yes. And that has just been increasing by leaps and bounds, and I think. It's the same principle. I think instead of a retail shop in these storefronts, you have a nonprofit, and they don't mm. pay taxes. Mm. So I think that's equally important, if not kind of more important. You're taking away the universities, at least, are sort of cloistered. Yes. But the storefront churches, in a sense, storefront groups, religious groups, are taking away, in a sense, from the well, tax. Base. Give or take an empty storefront. A you know, a supposed retail storefront. That's an interesting question because that's a. I feel like that's that could be a, like almost like a political philosophy question to ask them is to say, especially most of the incumbent city council lawyers are hugely in favor of pilot, are mm-hmm. hugely in favor of pilot. And pilot is basically the, the, the city saying you're a nonprofit. So okay, so you're a nonprofit. You're an educational or what is it? Educational or something else organization. And so supposedly you're doing something for the public good, and so you're gonna we're gonna make it so that people can create organizations like this and not have to worry about paying taxes on their profits. Mm-hmm. But the city council at least doesn't like this idea, and so but rather than revoking their corporate charters or revoking the nonprofit status, they say we just want to try to figure out a way to basically avoid we're gonna threaten going to war with you, but instead of going to war with you, you're gonna give us a little bit of money for the library, and then at least in the city of Worcester, they give a little bit of money for the library, and the city gives them whatever they want as far as land use. Like a street. Like they, like the city gives them a street, right? Which is okay. I mean, it no, seems like... No, I think that's appalling. I think, well, anyway, I think that they basically, or WPI, they give them the... WPI got a street, too. They got that a street, was, That too. was before we started. That was before shows. the pilot. But WPI got whatever. They got to develop the biotech park or yeah. whatever the heck it was as part of their pilot deal. Just, just to ask the city councilor straight up, like, do you believe that there should be nonprofits? Mm-hmm. If you do believe there should be nonprofits, how does this jive with pilot? If you don't believe that there should be nonprofits, that's interesting. Expand on that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, going uh, without totally revisiting, revisiting what we were just talking about with, like, revenue, but I, I think that's one of those places where what are the challenges for the city to come up with, like, a, a meaningful online payment system, right? There's a, you could shake a tree over WPI or Clark and find the individuals who could make that system a reality by the end of business day tomorrow, right? I mean, it's, it's not hard to do. That, that's where I think we miss out a lot in terms of our pilot discussions, where we do always view it as like a bottom line, here's, where, here's the money that we know that they have in their endowments, when in, in reality it's, it's not money that they have because we have state laws that say, you know, those endowments need to be protected, especially when it comes to chairs and whatnot. You know, their endowment can shrink, but they're still legally obligated to keep a, 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 ch- a particular chair funded or whatnot. So the money isn't as, as liquid as we like to think it is at times, but the services that they could provide, the schools, we've got amazing talent in this city. And oftentimes we're, we're scratching our heads saying, how do we do a better job of getting that talent to engage with the city and become long-term partners, maybe even residents or, city, or you know, residents of the city? And I think one of the best ways to do that is to tap into their resources from an educational perspective and say, you know, actually bring them into the fold, like, you know, especially from a technological and a uh, engineering perspective before they're even graduating. Bring them in, make sure they're there as interns, but give them free reign to actually start rethinking the way we do business as a as, as a local you know, municipality, and then you're automa- you're giving them some, the students themselves and the university some stock in, in the way the the, um, the city is shaped moving forward. It's a uh, yeah, it, it almost seems like trying to squeeze you know for real blood from a stone there when it comes to pilot because there's they're just not legally obligated to turn over a- any cash to us, and you would need both federal and state legislation to make that happen in any sort of meaningful way. Is that they're not, not for true? profit. That's the federal law? They're not for profits. I mean, depending on where, I mean, they're, they're registered as not profits both for, for the purpose of federal taxes and state taxes. But um, Boston you know, is able to do it, so Boston how are they is, able to do it? Boston was, is able, basically came to some gentlemen's agreements with the city of, with the, the, college, the, the colleges out there, be, and primarily because land is tighter. 
you know, I mean, we're still developing in Worcester, you know, and that's one of the things in Boston, if you want to actually take, like where I parked for work just last week, I was told I can't park there anymore because it's turning into, into condos, right? I mean, enormous, enormous parking lot. It's by the end of the summer, they're, they're breaking ground for, for condominiums. We don't see, we don't have that kind of, um, you know, we, we have to get rid of a parking lot to build a condominium sort of thing. So it's really hard to try and squeeze the colleges for land use rights or what have you, uh, you know, when, when a college wants to expand. Like with the street thing, I agree. It's it's kind of silly that we're turning turning over a street to, to the college. That's quite different. It's not so much expansion. Um, What's that? It's to me one thing I really dislike about Worcester City government is that they feel free mm -hmm. to make a what I call under the table agreement. Sure. With the college, y you know, you should not. There simply should be layers of legislation and civic action mm -hmm. before you can just take away a street. Oh yeah, I, I agree. But I'm sorry. I, I just, no, no. By only, I mean, I think one of the big issues there too is is the lack of actual engagement on the citizens' part when that sort of thing comes up. I mean, you actually you had to have some some pretty hardcore neighborhood activism stepping up saying, oh, wait a second, you're about to sign on the dotted line here. We haven't had a public conversation about this. At some point in time, you know, the average Joe in the city also needs to take some responsibility for the way their government acts. And oftentimes, I mean, I think we, it's, you know, the classic, we, we get the government we deserve, right? I mean, not necessarily the government that we want by virtue of, of our input. And there's always the people that are, you know, as engaged as they possibly can be, but there's a lot of people out there who just aren't paying attention to their own neighborhoods when it comes to encroachment from private entities or not-for-profits, whatever the case may be. Well, the whole difficulty, though, is that Worcester operates in secret. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, everything almost is done in secret. The whole thing about selling Downing Street, yep. <laughs> which we get no money for, except that, of course, um, the city gets money through pilot some yep. way for that. But the average person, you know, that's a... It's a big Worcester deal. has almost no streets that go through. Right. You know, May Street goes through, that street goes through, and then Maywood goes through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with you completely. And, I mean, the, the transparency issue is, is ridiculous, especially when you consider that, you know, everybody on the city council and everybody in the city manager's administration and all of his administrative heads consider themselves to be one of the most tra transparent bodies in, in the city. We, nothing could be further from the truth. We still we don't even know what's going on with our streets. We don't know we, what's going until on. Until after it's been decided. I mean, we, we, we don't know much of anything. I mean, any time that the, the, the paper... That's just a, always been a problem with this show, though, not knowing anything. I mean, this, this is true. I mean, that's why, but we're good at making stuff up. <laughs> the, um, but I mean, Poor whenever conference. the paper of record tries to find something out, I mean, they necessarily need to bring in a legal team for, for that. I mean, yeah, the transparency, I think, is always going to be a big issue here. No, but. It's not even just transparency. It's that they don't want anybody to speak. You have to ask permission to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, at a council meeting, it's absurd. Oh, and not only yes. that, but of course, uh, City Hall flouts the open meeting law. Right. I and think you know, considerably. It's interesting too. We, I just had this conversation with some folks up at the IG's office recently, as part of a training. How you know it, we take for granted how recent the open meeting law and transparency in state and local government is. You know, it wasn't until the John. It was only the Johnson administration where like actual transparency. You know, FOIA on the federal level became a, a federal reality, which is a very recent thing. We like to think that we've always had an open and transparent government in the United States. Nothing could be further from the truth. It was the Johnson administration that began the whole FOIA process, and that trick took decades to trickle down. To the state and local level. So we never trickle down to the state of Massachusetts. Well, that, they don't follow the well, open the, meeting the, law. The, the, the Attorney General's office and the Inspector General's office probably takes that issue probably more serious than any other. Um, it, it, when it gets to a local level, though, you're absolutely right. But a lot of that is because we still have people that, in a way, are, are holdovers to older generations and older administrations that just aren't used to the idea that when somebody asks for information, they're legally bound to turn it over. And it's almost like they don't understand that it's not a game. You know, it's not like a it's not a political muscle sort of thing. It is a legal reality that when when an individual a citizen asks for, for 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 records or information or expects something to be posted regarding a meeting, that that information isn't it, you're obligated to give it give, give it out and for you know reasonable costs and, and within reasonable time frames we pretend it, it's not just Worcester it's most municipalities around here do pretend that that those laws don't exist but I think a lot of it is out of ignorance that the laws are even there well we need to we need to wrap up the show because we're almost out of time I feel like I'm slowly getting a sense though of what we should be asking the city council <laughs> candidates as they come on this show or as we track them down in their own home what we should be asking them this year I don't know Joe Hart Thank you for being on the show, and thank you for operating the camera. Thank you for having me. I wish uh, I was, had been a little more organized. Oh, that's okay. Well, I hope, <laughs> hope we can have you on again. Brendan Mellican also on the show today. Stop smashing glass around here, people. Come it's on, okay. kids. Think of the kids and the dogs. There's the dogs. Come on. And Michael Benedetti and my sexy body today on the show. We will see you all next week.